The scripture reading for today's sermon is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Revelation, chapter 3, verses 7 through 13, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, behold, I will make them come and that bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you, brother. Well, we've sung some great truths this morning. We've sung of Jesus' love for us. We've sung of His grace for us. And as we come to God's Word this morning, let's keep in mind that the road of faithfulness that Jesus calls us to walk is a road of faithfulness He Himself has already walked. Church, He loves us. He left His heavenly throne where He had all delight and joy for all eternity to come live on a rugged, hard road of life in a dark and fallen and sinful world where evil and sin and darkness and Satan abounds. He lived his life in the face of every single temptation and withstood them all. That he laid down his life on a Roman cross where he bore himself the wrath of Almighty God for your sin and my sin for the sin of the world. And God raised him up from the grave seeing that his sacrifice was sufficient and pure and perfect and completely satisfying to a holy and a just God. Amen? Amen. That's what we mean when we talk about God loving us. That's what his love for us means. So that every moment from now to eternity... We can walk in the favor and the joy and the security and the confidence and the grace of God as our own. And it's with that love of Christ that we're called to persevere. Let's pray. Father, in these moments, don't let us escape from the love of Christ. Don't let us run from his open arms. And as we walk this road of faith, this journey of persevering to know and follow Christ, may we never forget that you walk this road so that we could be empowered to follow you and walk and live free of sin and its condemnation and its guilt and its shame. Holy Spirit, we need Revelation 3 this morning. Every one of us need it. I need it. So Lord, through my human weakness, but my trust in you, please bring your word 
to our ears in a way that is marked not by the wisdom of men, but by the power of the Spirit who gives life. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, the only evaluation of our lives that really matters is God's. The only evaluation of our lives that matters is God's. I'm reminded of this every time I read through Kings and Chronicles. The life of every king of Israel and Judah was summarized in one of two phrases. Either he did right in the sight of the Lord, he did good in the sight of the Lord, or he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Regardless of how many thousands of things happen in the lifetime of a king, regardless of how many uh, successes or losses he had throughout his lifetime, regardless of whether he started out well and ended poorly or started out poorly and ended well, at the end of his life there was one assessment and only one that mattered, what God said was true about his life. Was he Faithful to the God of heaven. Success and faithfulness have very different appearances, do they not? William Carey is known as one of the most significant missionaries in church history. He's often referred to as the father of modern missions, and yet in the first seven years of his ministry in India, many would have questioned his success. Not a single convert, can you imagine? Can you imagine how often William Carey had to get up in the morning and encourage his soul to be faithful to the Lord? It's not like it wasn't costly to go there and a couple centuries ago. Carey didn't have a single convert in the first seven years. He would get up on Sunday morning and he would preach only to his family. And yet he was faithful. And in time, his faithfulness to God revealed that God had indeed opened a great door for the gospel in India. By the end of his life, William Carey had translated the Bible into multiple languages. It's it's unbelievable. I mean, this is just like, uh, they talk about him being a machine. (laughs) He's just a workhorse. Apparently God gave him a great mind and he didn't work alone. He had a team who worked along with him. But by the time he died, the Bible had been been translated into multiple languages. He had uh, had started a college, the first one to offer degrees in in India, and he had led more than 700 people to Christ, which at the time seemed like only a drop or two in the sea of Indian souls. Such success was not unmatched by deep personal losses, however, as Carey, uh, William Carey buried his first two wives and a son and a very close companion, all while persevering on this road of faithfulness to Christ. And yet Carey persevered. By God's hand, faithfulness gave way to great fruitfulness. Now, now, not all of us will have uh, or experience the kind of fruitfulness that William Carey did in his lifetime, right? I mean, I'm a little behind if I'm going to catch up with William Carey. But all of us are promised unspeakable reward for faithfulness to Christ at whatever cost God has ordained in our lives. The Church of Philadelphia, as we come to uh, the second to last church in Revelation 3 here, the Church of Philadelphia can be summed up in just one word, faithful, 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 day in and day out, persevering, but faithful. It's not known as a powerhouse in its community. In fact, sometimes it may have felt as though the church was having little effect in a society where paganism was growing on steroids. And yet the believers in Philadelphia were not giving in to the pressure of society. They were just persevering in faithfulness to Jesus and His Word, refusing to deny Jesus' name. Of the seven churches 
that Jesus addresses in Revelation 2 and 3, only two are not rebuked by Jesus. Only two. Not rebuked for their compromise or their tolerance of sin. Philadelphia is one of those two that Jesus only commends and encourages to remain faithful. And yet there's an implicit warning in this message. Faithfulness today doesn't automatically guarantee faithfulness tomorrow. Success in the past does not necessarily guarantee fruit in the future. So Jesus reminds the believers in Philadelphia that there is great reward, reward for those who remain faithful to Christ to the end. It's worth it. It's worth it. And this is the message we should glean from Revelation 3 this morning. We must persevere in our loyalty to Jesus and His Word because He will reward faithfulness with eternal blessing. As we unpack Revelation 3 this morning, verses 8 through 13, uh, we are going to, 7 through 13 that is, uh, we are going to consider four truths that will motivate us to persevere in faithfulness to Jesus and His Word. Here's the first one. We must persevere in light of who Christ is. We persevere in light of who Christ is and His authority to determine our standing with God. Look at verse 7. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. Jesus highlights three aspects of his own character that directly relate to the church's faithfulness and their need to continue on this road of perseverance. First, Jesus is the Holy One. To be holy is to be set apart. Set apart for God's purposes. Set apart from sin. Set apart. Separate from uh, the, the staining influences of this world. Jesus' life on this earth demonstrated that He is pure, set apart, For his father, as I mentioned earlier, that's why Jesus could lay down his life as an acceptable sacrifice before a holy and just God on our behalf. He came with no sin of his own. So the one for whom the church of Philadelphia has been set apart is himself the set apart one, the sinless one. Second, Jesus is the true one. Jesus, the true Messiah, Uh, Even though he was rejected by men, much like the the Christians in Philadelphia were rejected by unbelieving Jews of their day. He's the true one. But this word true can also carry with it connotations of faithfulness. That is, the one to whom they have been true, the one to whom they have been faithful, is the faithful one. He is. Remember back in chapter 1, Jesus was referred to as the faithful witness. Why is this significant to Revelation? Because the one who was faithful, the one who was faithful to the truth of God, even unto death, is the one who sets the model and sets the pace for all those who are called to follow him. Throughout the book of Revelation, believers are, are called to be faithful even unto death. A calling that Jesus himself demonstrated by and fulfilled by his own life. Holy One, the True One. In Revelation 6.10 we see both of these titles used of Jesus together again uh, with, with the force of divine sovereignty. The Sovereign Lord as the martyrs call on Jesus to vindicate them. Look at chapter 6 verse 10. They cried out with a loud voice, O Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? The one to whom the church of Philadelphia has been faithful is the one who has the ability to vindicate them before their persecutors. Their faithfulness will not be in vain. It will not be in vain. And we see this in the third characteristic of Jesus now in verse 7. 
the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. Now, certainly Jesus can open doors of opportunity in ways that supersede the manipulations of men, but Jesus is speaking of something much more significant than that here. The key of David is a messianic term that represents Jesus' authority over the kingdom of God. Jesus has authority to control entrance into the heavenly kingdom. Now the thrust of verse 7 is that if Jesus opens the door of salvation to you, no one can close it. He alone has the keys. If you have keys, you have authority. And no one else has that authority but Jesus alone. Uh, recent, earlier this summer, we were flying out to Washington to, uh, to go to Milo's and Beth's wedding. Um, we had a little hiccup in the airport uh, when um, our flight got delayed to the next day. And when we got to the airport the next day to pick up our flight, they printed the, the boarding passes for the day before, and then they didn't want to let us through security, and we're, all this hubbub's going on, we have to go all the way back through sec- to the desk again, and, and I told them, we're not going to get through, se- we're not going to get through security on time, we're going to miss our flight if we have to go through security again, and then this guy said, I got it, this kid, you know, like, he looked like he was 16 years old, with a yellow vest on, and, but he had a set of keys, <laughs> he had a set of keys, so you follow me, and we, we, buzzed behind him, and he just walked us through every place we needed to go, right up to the front of where we needed to be. He had the authority because he had the key. Jesus holds the key to the kingdom of God. And when he opens the door, nobody has the power or the authority to close it. This was especially powerful encouragement to the church of Philadelphia because apparently what had happened in Philadelphia is that when when the, the Jews in Philadelphia came to faith in Christ, converted to Jesus, the unbelieving Jews in control of the synagogue excommunicated them from the synagogue. Now that's a big deal because if you're excommunicated from the synagogue, you're a castaway in, in Jewish society. They were pushed to the edge. They were rejected. Believers were shut out by the Jewish community, but Jesus reminds them that he, not the Jews, holds the keys of the kingdom. Their faithfulness to Jesus means an open door to the kingdom of God because Jesus holds the keys and no one has the authority to bypass the Son of God. You may be rejected. But I have opened a door you cannot, that cannot be closed. What incredible encouragement verse 7 is. No amount of rejection in this life or in this world can undermine the welcome and acceptance of Jesus to those who faithfully trust in Him. Faithfulness to Jesus is worth any amount of rejection you suffer in this world. So what do you do? When you're marginalized, what do you do when you are slandered? What do you do when you are dismissed? What do you do when you are put down for your faith? You remind yourself, God has opened to me the door of the kingdom, and it cannot be closed. Be faithful. The second truth we need to see here in Revelation 3 is that the value, the value of our perseverance is determined not by earthly success, but by Jesus' authority to give us the kingdom. Look down at verse 8. I know your works. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. What does Jesus mean when he says, I know that you have but little power? What's he talking about? Jesus is referring to the church's status in their secular community. The church, having been ostracized by the Jewish synagogue, was despised and looked down upon. They were marginalized. They lacked influence politically. They were struggling economically. 
They were like a minnow in the Pacific Ocean. Not only are they small in comparison, minusculely small in comparison, but in terms of influence, they appear to be at the bottom of the food chain. Not all things should be valued on the basis of appearance, should they? Despite their seemingly minimal influence, they have kept Jesus' word. They have not denied His name. They have patiently endured. They may not appear to be successful, but they are faithful. And Jesus honors faithfulness. He always honors faithfulness. It could be easy for any church to grow discouraged when they see how little their impact is in light of the vast needs surrounding them. Imagine how, how challenging it is for us in our community. Imagine plopping a church of 100 people in the heart of New York City or Los Angeles or Dallas or Philadelphia, USA. It could be easy to grow discouraged when the church is slandered by those who trample down biblical values in mainline society, especially in a smaller community. It's not just rhetoric, it's not just talk, it's feels, it feels personal, right? Or when they see some of the, or when a church sees some of the, the little precious fruit they thought they had fall from the vine, it can be discouraging. But it can be equally tempting to look at whatever success we may have been entrusted with and pride ourselves in comparison to other churches. Ooh, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. And yet success, as we measure it in this world, is not what God values most. He looks for a pure heart. He looks for a heart that seeks to please God. He looks for steadfastness and obedience, faith, patient endurance. He looks for faithfulness. To the overlooked, marginalized, ostracized, and seemingly insignificant church of Philadelphia, Jesus says, you have kept my word, you've not denied my name, and I have set before you an open door that no one can close. Yours is the kingdom of God. That's a powerful encouragement. Your perseverance and your faithfulness to me matter because I have the authority to give you the kingdom of God. The message of verse 9 is don't persevere on the basis of appearance. Don't persevere on the basis of appearance. Persevere by faith in the one who holds the key. The third truth that we need to see in Revelation 3 is that we can persevere in the face of opposition and rejection knowing that Christ will vindicate His followers with His love. Rejection is painful. There's no way around that. Being lied about and misrepresented is painful. The Philadelphia church has not only felt its smallness, but also the pains of persecution from those who claim to be the people of God, but slander and reject those who believe in Jesus and those who follow His Word. To them, Jesus not only promises the reward of life in the kingdom, but also vindication before their enemies. Look at verse 9. Behold, I, make those, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. Jesus addresses those here who have claimed to be Jews and were not. He's not talking about people who are lying about their ethnicity. He's not not talking about those who are Gentiles but claiming to be Jews. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about those who claim to be the people of God because they are Jewish, Jews ethnically, 
but are not the true people of God because they've rejected God's Messiah. This is, Paul has this discussion in Romans 2 where he talks about not all Jews are true Jews. They may be Jews ethnically, but if they don't have faith, they're not a true Jew. They're not a true child of God, one who's set apart as God's own promised children. See, there's only two kinds of people, only two kinds, believers in Jesus and unbelievers. You live in one of those two camps. You're a follower of Jesus or you're not a follower of Jesus. There's the people of God, the, the true church, and there is then the people of Satan, the world under Satan's dominion. Now, it's just a strong language here in verse 9, isn't it? But there's nothing in between. Jesus said of the hostile, unbelieving Jews of his day, you belong to your father, the devil. Paul tells us that Satan is the god of this world. There's no middle world. We live in the overlap of the two conflicting kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. There's nothing else. You're a follower of Christ, or you're living under the dominion of Satan, who's the god of this world. And so, Jesus When he says he will make these religious imposters come and bow down at the believer's feet, it's a picture of vindication, being subjected to believers who will reign with Christ, as we saw back in chapter 2, verses 26 and 27. There will come a day when it will be evident to everyone that believers in Jesus, those who truly follow Jesus with living faith, are the chosen people of God that he has set his saving love upon. As you persevere in faithfulness to Jesus, be encouraged that Jesus has opened the door of the kingdom to you which no one can shut, and He will vindicate you before your enemies by making His love for you known. It's why it's important for us to keep reading it further into the book of Revelation, right? Because right now, your, your greatest maybe felt need today was not, Lord, deliver me from my enemies. You may think that when you watch the news and you dabble in politics, but in your day-to-day life, you may not feel it as much. But the reality is, the closer and the closer we get to the end days, the more hostile Satan and his regime will, will become against true followers of Christ. And in those days, we will long for justice like we do today, but more. And in those days, we'll long to be vindicated before our enemies. And in those days, we could trust that Christ Himself will settle accounts. The fourth truth that we're going to focus on in Revelation 3 this morning is that our perseverance will be met with Christ's protection. Our perseverance will be met with Christ's protection. Verse 10. Because you have kept my word, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. There's a big verse. This verse is highly debated by theologians, and the whole debate centers around the word from. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. It's a Greek word ek, it's a preposition. If you translate a number of different ways, the most common way is from, that's why it's from in our translations. The question is, what did Jesus mean when he said the word ek, from? The reason they're they're so interested in this word is because the hour of trial here is not just some passing tribulation that's going to come upon just the church of Philadelphia. No, clearly here, Jesus is speaking about the great tribulation in the last days. As we see in Mark 13, The tribulation will come on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. That's what Jesus says here. This is a worldwide tribulation of unprecedented proportion. 
And how we think about that and how we feel about that coming day of tribulation all hangs on this little two-letter Greek word. From. What does that mean? By the way, this is the last phrase of, of before we get back to act, the last phrase of, of verse 10, those who dwell on the earth, is used 10 times in the book of Revelation, and every time it is used as a reference to unbelievers. So this trial, this is, is gonna, it's going to test unbelievers who are on earth, the whole earth, in this time of tribulation. Here's the question. Does the word from mean that Jesus will remove believers before the tribulation? Or does it mean he will keep them from the testing, in other words, preserve their faith in the midst of the tribulation? Okay. It's not completely clear from the Greek preposition itself, and to complicate matters further, an argument can be made from the rest of Scripture for either a pre-tribulation rapture of the church or a mid-tribulation rapture of the church or a post-tribulation rapture of the church. In other words, we don't really know. <laughs> right? We sure want it to be one way or the other. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, right? I mean, here, here's the reality. Here, let's just be, let's just be honest. Um, most people in the, in the church, generally speaking, are, they love a pre-tribulational uh, rapture view because that's what they want. I don't want to go through tribulations. I think I like that view over there. Or they're, uh, they, they, they're of a pre-tribulational um, view because they've read the Left Behind series. And they really like that series. And uh, that's obviously got to be true because it's supposed to be a reflection of Scripture even though it's not all, it's, it's stories based on some biblical truths. So more difficult when all we take is the text of Scripture and we have to sort through it. I'll say that when I began my theological training, um, I, was, I was taught a pre-tribulational view. That's what I was um, taught. That's what I was persuaded with initially. But I've become less persuaded of that view over the years. In other words, <laughs> I hold it a lot more humbly than I used to. Of course, I would love the pre-trib view, just like you would, to be right, because I don't want to go through the tribulation. But... Consider this. The same construction, keep from, in the Greek grammar here, keep from. I know we're in the weeds, but just hang on with me for a second. Okay, the same structure that's used in Revelation 3.10 is also used by Jesus in John 17 and by Peter in 2 Peter 2.9. In John 17, verse 15, Jesus said, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Hmm. Does that, does that give us a complete answer to Revelation 3.10? No. It's just something we should keep in mind. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the Lord says, uh, Peter says, The Lord knows how to keep the godly from testing. Praise God for that. Because there's a lot of testing through our lifetime, but God in His grace knows how to preserve our faith. To keep us. And what I'm simply trying to show you here is that the same construction in Revelation 3.10 could mean that Jesus will keep their faith from being overcome in the time of tribulation. Well, unfortunately, we don't have time to settle this discussion today. <laughs> I'm going to leave you hanging a little bit. But here's what we know for sure. 2 Timothy 3.12 Timothy 3.12 says, But all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. To be honest, I don't know if we will be delivered before the tribulation or in the tribulation or after the tribulation. There's lots of passages. I have my leanings, but there's a lot of passages that could be taken multiple ways. But here's what we know. As we get closer and closer to the end days, times of testing and tribulation will increase. And there isn't a single one of us who does not have to be ready and prepared to have our faith 
tested severely. It may be by persecution. It may be by losing our job. It may be by public slander because of our biblical views. Or we might be tested through severe health issues or financial issues or things unrelated to persecution, but all of us need to be prepared, be prepared to have our faith tested. What Jesus promised to the church of Philadelphia is that because you have kept my word by patiently enduring, I will keep you in the hour of testing. I think this is actually the most powerful um, way to understand Revelation 3.10. It does not mean that we won't experience suffering or even martyrdom, but that we will, God will sustain our faith. Christ will sustain our faith, which has been proven genuine in earlier times of testing. Keep in mind that the whole point of Jesus' encouragement here is to inspire ongoing perseverance. His point isn't to say, well, you can give up now. We're through the storm now. No, he's saying, hold on, hold fast, persevere. Don't lose sight of the end. So church, write this on your heart today. Write this on your heart. If you keep my word, I will keep you. If you keep my word, I will keep you. Or we might say, those who persevere, Jesus preserves. Now you might, you might, you might kind of wrestle with that a little bit. It might, might, for some of you, it might not sit quite right because it's like, well, wait a minute, is, is everything dependent on, on me now? Or, or is it dependent on God? Or, I mean, what, is, is, my, is my standing with God and then determined on my perseverance? Well, the Bible, the New Testament clearly teaches that true saints will persevere and those who persevere in the end will be demonstrated to be true in their faith. Remember last week, it's a little bit like last week, remember last week I told you about there's, there's kind of this joint um, work between us and, and, and God when it comes to the work of sanctification, right? So we are called to pursue sanctification, remember that? And when we take a step of faith or take a step of obedience, God himself does the sanctifying work, the work of change in our hearts. That's why Paul prayed in, in Thessalonians that we would be sanctified fully, both body and soul. Do you remember that? So we, we pursue the sanctification without no one will see the Lord. And, and as we do that, God himself does the actual work of change, sanctifying us. Well, a similar kind of thing is happening here. As we persevere, as we take a step of perseverance, God is doing the, pers the preserving work of our faith. So true faith is not without action. It's not without endurance. But we endure by the power of the Spirit, by the grace of God actively at work in our life. Okay, let's come to our last point now in Revelation 3. Our perseverance will be met with eternal blessing. Verse 11. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God and out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus makes uh, several amazing promises to the one who conquers, the one who overcomes, that is the one who perseveres. The one who conquers, and he addresses here in verse 12, is the one who holds fast in verse 11. So to conquer means to persevere in the book of Revelation, okay? The one who keeps his hope fixed on the second coming of Christ, the one who patiently endures, 
this one, Jesus says, will not lose his crown. That is the promise of eternal life. So what will be the reward of one's perseverance? Well, first Jesus says, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out from it. This pillar in the temple of God is a picture of permanence and stability in our heavenly dwelling place. Revelation describes heaven as the temple of God. What do pillars do? They're stable. They're, they're secure. They, they <laughs> hold the roof up, right? They're not going anywhere. You don't move pillars, right? It's incredible uh, imagery, especially for those in Philadelphia. In A.D. 17, Philadelphia had suffered from tremendous earthquakes, severe earthquakes that had ongoing aftershocks, so much so that not only did it basically level the city, but they could not go back in to live in the city. They, the people, most of the population went out and lived in the farmland around the city because they, they were fearful uh, and insecure because of the aftershocks from the, the, the uh, earthquakes. The city was eventually rebuilt, actually um, rebuilt and actually then renamed a couple times uh, to honor the emperors who, who uh, withheld taxes and gave money for the, t- the city to be rebuilt. But anyway, uh, even though the city was rebuilt, there was a, a remaining sense of uncertainty among the people of Philadelphia. And yet to the faithful believers in Philadelphia, Jesus promised the security and the strength of a permanent dwelling in God's presence. The thing they longed for physically in their lives, just a a house that doesn't collapse. He says, I will give you eternally a dwelling place with God that cannot be shaken. A future so stable and secure that they will never go out of His presence or His favor. Next, Jesus promises a threefold inscription on those who endure. First, Jesus says, I will write on him the name of my God. What does that mean? It indicates ownership. We belong to God. By the way, what God writes and what God decrees cannot be overturned. It's permanent. Then Jesus says he will write on him the name of the city of God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven. And this means that we have a permanent citizenship in heaven. It's inscribed on us. This is your identity. This is where you belong. This is your citizenship. It cannot be changed, inscribed by God. And then finally, Jesus will write his own new name on those who overcome. You want to know what the new name is? You'll have to wait until Jesus comes. (laughs) Revelation 19 tells us that when Jesus returns on his white horse to wage the final war as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, there will be a name written on him which no one knows except himself. Now, there's significance to this idea of an unknown name because in, in ancient culture, to have a name that was not known by someone else meant that that, that person could not exercise authority over you. So when, when Revelation 19 speaks of Jesus coming, bearing many diadems, that is, so, badges of sovereignty over sovereigns, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he will have a name which no one knows ex- except himself, which means there is no one who could possibly exercise authority over Jesus as the Christ and the King. But Revelation 3.12 should just leave you speechless. Jesus will write on us His own new name. Who do you entrust your security to? Who do you entrust your pen numbers to? Your bank account numbers to? Probably your spouse. 
one closest to you. The one you've given the trust of your heart, your faith to. This is an incredible picture of the intimacy that Jesus will share with his followers. He will entrust to us the deepest reality of who he is in his fullness as the bridegroom of his bride. And for this, Jesus says, persevere. It's worth it. This is Jesus' message to all who have ears to hear. Do you have ears to hear? It's a message of reward and blessing, stability and permanence in the warm favor of God for those who remain faithful to Christ. Like the church of Philadelphia, we are, we are living, church, in a culture that will seek to cancel us. Oh, it's just getting started. They will seek to intimidate us to silence. They don't want our biblical values or our worldview. It threatens their way of life. True believers will be marginalized and persecuted. We'll begin to experience more and more closed doors from our society. But though we face rejection, we can persevere despite our lack of earthly power or our lack of earthly influence, knowing that God has opened to us a door that cannot be closed. There's not a person or a power in this world that can overrule the opening of that door. Not the world, not the Antichrist, and not even the devil himself. And just remember, if you're one of the martyrs of Revelation, if it costs you your life, your last dying breath is your triumph over the evil one. For your faith has remained true, and the door of the kingdom is yours. Just as when Jesus died on the cross, his death was not death. Oh, it was a real death, but his death was victory, it was triumph. He demonstrated the resilience of His purity and His holiness and His devotion to His Father through the last breath. And the kingdom of Satan took its blow. We can persevere because Jesus has opened to us the only door that matters. And in the end, His evaluation of our lives is the only one that matters. May He find us faithful for our eternal joy in Him. Worship team, come on up. We're going to sing a prayer again, church. I invite you to stand. And we're going to Make this your prayer this morning on this road of perseverance, on this road where Christ calls you to faithfulness. This is how we pray. Let's sing together.